Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Kelly McCreary and I have served on the board of EJS since 2015. It is my great honor to welcome you all to the Equal Justice Society's virtual 20th anniversary gala. In the past five years, I have borne witness to the growth and greatness of EJS as our organization has fought for the rights of students of color and students with disabilities, women, and people of color throughout California and the United States. Celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Equal Justice Society becomes more and more significant with every passing day. 20 years ago, the Equal Justice Society's goal was to put the issue of race back on the table. Tonight, we look back and recognize the successes of our last two decades as we continue pushing forward race conscious remedies for discrimination. As we look to the decade ahead of us, our path may seem daunting, but united in solidarity, we can achieve our vision of a just future with opportunities for all. This evening, it is my pleasure to invite you to forget the outside world for the next hour as you sit back, relax, and revel in the mastery of Marcus Shelby and his musical collaborators as they perform Harriet Tubman through the eyes of children. The performance will be followed by a question and answer moderated by board chair Michael Harris, Marcus Shelby, and EJS staff members Mona Tawatau and Chris Bridges. Thank you for being here with us. And now I'll hand it over to my co-host, Rennell Brooks Moon. Thank you so much, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be with you tonight. I'm Rennell Brooks Moon, the voice of your San Francisco Giants at Oracle Park. Now, before we begin, I'd like to share some special features that we have implemented to make this evening feel more like a community event even though we're all watching from the comfort of our homes. You can follow along with the chapters of the musical performance by clicking on the program tab on this webpage. Or if you're watching on YouTube, sections are listed in the description. You can join the conversation with live comments about the performance by entering your comments and questions in the join the conversation box below the performance screen, and on YouTube, the comment section is enabled for the same purpose. Please use these conversation and comment boxes to enter any questions that you would like answered during the question and answer period after the performance. And now I wanna give a big shout out to all of our supporters and friends who have already given so generously for tonight's event. This evening would not have been possible without your support. Now to facilitate easier giving online, we have implemented a simple text to donate tool for you. Text EJS20 to 44321 for a secure and easy way to support EJS financially tonight. Once again, text EJS20 to 44321. And we thank you for whatever you can donate tonight. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, colleague, and mentor, my media sister, Cron 4 Evening News anchor, the incomparable Pam Moore. Welcome again to everyone celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Equal Justice Society. This evening, as we look back at the legacy EJS has created over these past 20 years, this organization wants to pay homage to the original founders and funders who made the promise of the Equal Justice Society a reality. So tonight, we thank the founders of EJS, Eva Patterson, Abim Thomas, Susan Serrano, Carrie Avery, Sheila Thomas, Michelle Alexander, Joan Graff, Margaret Russell, Margolin Armstrong, Shauna Marshall, Angela Harris, Stephanie Wildman, Cheryl Stevens, April Williams, and Norm Spaulding. EJS also wants to express appreciation to the founding donors, those who believed and supported the vision early on. Elizabeth Cabrazer, 
Jack London, Quinn Delaney, and Wayne Jordan, Alan Jenkins through the Ford Foundation, Sarah Rios, Gara LaMarche through the Open Societies Institute, Catherine Samuels, John Cowell, and Rakiba Labray. And of course, special thanks to the founding board members, Charles Ogletree, John Bonifaz, James J. Brosnahan, Kate Kendall, Tobias B. Wolf, Eric K. Yamamoto, Maria Blanco, and Margaret Russell. Each of these amazing people saw the need, had the vision, and played an integral role in shaping the institution we're here to celebrate right now. Their efforts and support have indelibly shaped the Equal Justice Society. We thank everyone named, everyone who believed in the need for justice and equality from the birth of this organization and 20 years later still fighting for the rights of all people. I am an EJS supporter myself, and I want to express my personal gratitude to Eva and all the staff and supporters for your determination all these years. With so many social justice challenges still before this nation, we need the Equal Justice Society now as much as we did 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pam, for grounding us in the contributions of the founders, founding donors, and founding board members who laid the path that we walk on today. Now, it is my great pleasure to welcome Reverend Diana McDaniel, who will be giving our evening a special blessing. Good evening. Greetings. I'm Diana McDaniel, and I'm from the tradition of Unity Church, which is the publisher of the Daily Word. To Eva, the Equal Justice Society, the staff, the family, we bless you and appreciate your 20 years of service to our community, a very needed social justice work. Implicit bias training, symposiums, awakening judges, suing FEMA after Katrina, remembering 1619 and 400 years of slavery and discrimination. Panel discussions, there's been so much that you've done over the years. Congratulations for enduring and thriving. We need you now more than ever. And as you've said, Eva, EJS was made for times such as these. You help us find hope. There are many of us here from different traditions, different faith traditions, from different cultures, and I invite you to go within to that special place within yourself where you meet the divine within you, where there is love and where there is peace. And whether you worship Allah or Krishna or or the great spirit, or Yahweh, goddess, Jesus Christ, or whether you worship not at all. We come together now, tonight, to honor, to celebrate and support the Equal Justice Society. We bless them as they continue to fight for justice for all of us and to move us forward. So would you join me now your hearts and minds, we join together no matter where you are in the sense of loving community and caring and in creating the beloved community. And so we breathe and breathe in that pure life of spirit to the ineffable. We give thanks for those upon whom show, whose shoulders we stand and those who continue this great work of creating a world that works for all of us. Together we struggle and for our civil rights, for our human rights. And today we remember and salute nonviolent civil resistance, the work to delve into our racist psyches and the sharing that black lives matter. Tonight, we give thanks for EJS, its founders, for the donors, for the staff, and for all those involved in the compassion of humanity and for tonight's artists, we are grateful for you that you are so talented and so blessed. Let us feel the outpouring of love and appreciation and encouragement for us all. Let us be guided by infinite wisdom and prospered by divine love. 
The mark of success is indeed a pun, EJS and each one of us. So let us trust that the light of God surrounds us and the love of God enfolds us, the power of God protects us, and the presence of God watches over us, that wherever we are, God is and all is well. And so we let it be. Amen. So stay safe. We see you doing well and continuing for another 20 years. We celebrate Equal Justice Society. And so it is. Amen. Thank you so, so much, Reverend McDaniel, representing Unity Church San Leandro. For this year's Equal Justice Society 2020 Gala, we are very honored to present Harriet Tubman Through the Eyes of Children, with music composed and conducted by Marcus Shelby. This production came together as we all experienced both the pandemic and global social protests against police violence in the aftermath of the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor murders. We all saw how a movement was inspired by young people, particularly black women. We are compelled to honor these protest experiences in our film and draw connections of activism and leadership to Harriet Tubman. And now for more, my co-host, Kelly McCreary. In Harriet Tubman, Through the Eyes of Children, we follow the path of a group of young black girls who are inspired by Harriet Tubman and other strong black women leaders. The story is told through film images and creative production by Kevin Johnson and Cheo Tahimba Taylor. Dance by Sky Palace. Painting and animation by Mike Robertson and music by the Marcus Shelby Quintet featuring Tiffany Austin, Rafa Postel, Luis Peralta, Genius Wesley, Ajayi Jackson, and of course, Marcus Shelby on bass. The musical score is comprised of spirituals, ring shouts, improvisation, call and response, and the blues. It will take us on the journey of Harriet Tubman's lifelong commitment to achieving freedom and the full rights of citizenship for her people. The final section honors the accomplishments of the Equal Justice Society and its relationship to the struggles led by so many Black women, such as Harriet Tubman. We hope to inspire children everywhere to honor their history and learn how to use their voice to fight for equity and justice, like the young girls in our film. Thank you to everyone who worked on this film, and thank you to the Equal Justice Society for the opportunity to create and imagine a better world. And now, esteemed patrons, Harriet Tubman, Through the Eyes of Children.
When the host got lost, 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 oh, they shouted when the host got lost in that red sea. Didn't they moan when the host got lost, lost, lost? Didn't they moan when the host got lost in that red sea? Didn't they shout when the host got lost, lost, lost? Didn't they shout when the host got lost in that red sea? Didn't they moan when the host got lost? When the host got lost, 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 in they shout when the host got lost in that red sea. Didn't they moan when the host got lost, 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 in they moan when the host got lost in that red sea. Didn't they dance when the host got lost, 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 in they dance when the host got lost in that red sea. Didn't they moan when the host got lost. Oh. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for EJS's 20th anniversary gala. We're so happy you joined us. We have a distinguished panel. 
that we've assembled to answer questions. And so we're going to move into the uh, question and answer phase. I'm joined on this panel. I'm Michael Harris, the chair of the board of EJS. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm joined on this stage. This is the 20th anniversary gala. We're so happy you joined us. We have a distinguished panel that we've assembled to answer questions. And so we're going to move into the uh, question and answer phase. I'm joined on this panel. I'm Michael Harris, the chair of the board of EJS. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm joined, I'm joined by Chris Bridges on the staff of EJS, as well as Mona Tawa, who's on the staff as well, who will be available for all questions. And the distinguished composer and performer who you've just enjoyed an hour's worth of his composition and performance um, that was spectacular. Um, Marcus Shell. So Marcus, can you tell us a little bit about how this whole thing came about? Yeah, how you doing? And I um, want to thank everybody for, for joining and attending virtually uh, this 20th year anniversary. And I just want to thank, uh, first off, thank Eva Patterson and the Equal Justice Society for the opportunity and this and the and the blessing to be able to perform and to create. And I'll just quickly say that um, originally, you know, before the pandemic and the shutdowns and the sheltering in place and all the, the, the ways that we had to sort of um, protect ourselves in public, we were originally going to do a live performance with my big band and four different singers and, um, and pretty much do a straight performance um, but when we discovered that it was highly unlikely that we were going to be able to perform live and that we were going to have to, uh, we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to do a live stream with no audience, we were kind of not sure. We were just sort of in a wait and see. And then it became very apparent that we weren't even going to be able to get together as a group. So um, we had to do what we always do. And one of the themes of of I know Eva Patterson is uh, improvisation. Uh, it's a big part of who we are as a people and it's to come up with creative ways to still um, create uh, even with challenges. And so, um, you know, I just wanna thank those who I was able to work with who brought a bunch of brilliant ideas um, from um, the director, Kevin, uh, producer Chael, um, to the, our stage manager and production manager, Kathy, uh, to all the musicians, uh, Rafa Apostle and uh, Genius Wesley and uh, amazing vocalist, uh, Tiffany Austin, and our pianist, Luis Peralta, and our percussionist, Ajayi Jackson, uh, and all the film crew. We all just sort of um, put our heads together and went into the Red Poppy and one afternoon and recorded and then spent some time in Oakland and caught all those beautiful murals. I wish I knew everybody's name that had created those murals um, and also a backyard in Oakland with our dancer Sky Palace. So it was a, a very much a multi-artistic collaboration between music, dance, film, um, and visual art. Oh, I, and I failed to mention our amazing, brilliant painter and, and the animation that captured uh, the history of EJS and our, and our powerful black women there in our last section. Um, and so we're very thankful to Michael Robertson, who was the painter for that. So um, it, um, we didn't start off with this idea, but uh, I'm so happy it came out the way that we did because our, our universe grew. We were able to include a bunch of beautiful children, uh, including my own uh, Kennedy Shelby and all the other beautiful young uh, girls who were part of this production. Okay, we have a question. Um, so this one is for um, Mona and Chris. And the question is, what are the three big things that you are working on at the moment at EJS? Thank you, Michael. 
And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us on our 20th anniversary tonight. And thank you to Marcus and all the wonderful artists for that amazing composition and film. Um, one of the big things that we're working on, I want to put in the context of structural racism, because that is one of the central demands of the, the Black Lives Movement um, that is being amplified, strengthened, um, that is growing now in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many others. Um, one of the things we're doing, and I'm thinking of this because of the, the beautiful young people that we saw just saw in the film is work um, to uh, deal with the fact that too many black and Latinx students, students with disabilities are disproportionately disciplined, um, pushed out of school, not provided with the support and the services and really the education that they need to, to thrive and to succeed. And so one of the things that EJS is working on as a, as a primary part of our work is um, uh, working on behalf of those students to stop those policies from uh, continuing in our school districts, um, both in Sacramento and in the Kern High School District, um, resulting in Kern in, in a landmark settlement that you saw and a little bit about in the film. And so what that really is about is replacing those really harmful policies that we can um, date back to um, actually slavery and, and not seeing our young people as uh, the beautiful human beings that they are and uh, replacing those policies with um, different kinds of responses, supportive responses to, to behavior. Uh, so that's one of the, the things that we are working on. Um, I'm going to kick it over to Chris and maybe we can tag team this a little bit. Thanks, Mona. Um, yes, uh, another thing that we're working on is extending or expanding the reach of our implicit bias trainings. And so we have a couple of different projects in the pipeline, one including a train the trainer program uh, that we hope to start being able to get more folks uh, providing implicit bias trainings under the EJS banner. And then also a project where we're hoping to partner with a school site uh, within a Oakland Unified School District or uh, another district we're looking at in uh, LA County, uh, in which we'll actually be working on a partnership of building out implicit bias uh, and other mind science trainings for uh, staff, teachers, administrators, as they're uh, considering how to properly or effectively uh, manage school discipline and also have just healthy policies in place for students uh, in the K through 12 system. So that's uh, another big item that we're working on. Okay, um, the next question is for Marcus. In all of your research, what role did music play in her life and struggles? Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this is in reference to um, the, the piece and the focus of the piece. Okay, thank you for that question. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a very good question because um, this is what attracted me to you know, try to write music about Harriet Tubman. Um, my mom gave me a book when I was like nine years old called Harriet Tubman, Moses of Her People. It was one of the first books written about her life. Um, and it was commissioned by someone who basically gave sort of a pop uh, culture rendition of Harriet Tubman with a lot of exaggerated facts and some really salty language. But it was really the only account of her story that was written down. And then, you know, since that time, we're talking over 100 years ago, um, there's been much research done, new research. And there's a book that was written by Kate Clifford Larson that I read uh, probably like 15 years ago. And it took me back to Harriet Tubman's story. And mainly it was that she did use uh, music. And when I say music, I'm mainly talking about spirituals to communicate, and she used them in different ways. Um, and many of these spirituals had double meanings, double entendres. Um, it's all sort of the foundation of all black music, which is founded on the blues. And within the construct of the blues, um, you have many ways of one can express themselves, express their how they feel. Um, they can hide 
what they're actually saying in, in some sort of uh, in some sort of creative way. It's the, the blues is actually the thing that allowed Harriet Tubman um, to communicate with those around her. Um, and I just want to read a little bit because when I saw the question, it reminded me of something that uh, Kate Clifford Larson had wrote in her book. And she basically said, Tubman also guided her groups of fugitives by singing spirituals and other songs with coded messages. Uh, if danger lurked nearby, Tubman would sing an appropriate spiritual to warn her party of an impending threat to their safety. When the road was clear, she would change her words or the temple of the song and guide them on the next, on the next safe place. She paid free blacks to follow white masters and slave catchers as they posted reward notices for the runaways she was trying to help escape and tear down the notices. Absolute commitment was required of all members of her parties. The weakness of one person could endanger the whole group. After first satisfying herself, they had enough courage and firmness to run the risk. She would complete her plans for their escape. And so, you know, to me, you know, when I think of music, I think of some of the spirituals. Uh, certainly Go Down Moses was one that was closely uh, associated with her history and her story because of the similar... Uh, the similarities. Um, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot had double meaning. Wade in the Water certainly was an important song because it gave you instruction on what to do once you escaped. Um, there is a bomb in Gilead uh, and many more. Um, and blue shouts, work songs, field haulers, uh, complaint calls, all of these tools, these musical tools were used for us as forms of liberation. And if I can uh, conclude, I'll say that um, the, even the whole idea of the blues, um, the, for me, the definition is the pursuit of freedom. Uh, freedom of melody, freedom of harmony, freedom of rhythm, uh, freedom of sound. Um, and that pursuit of freedom began uh, when the first uh, enslaved African was brought here back in 1619. Um, and so that is the, the source language that Harriet Tubman used. She wasn't the only one. Uh, she was actually, she was quite effective though. Okay, thank you for that, Marcus. Um, we have another question for you uh, from the audience. How long have you been collaborating with EJS and what drew you to EJS? Oh, wow. You know, I, I'm gonna say I met, um, I met Eva Patterson, I believe it was the year 2000, like December 2000. It was through a choreographer by the name of, of Reginald Savage. And um, me and Eva, we hit it off right away, like-minded in a lot of different ways, a lot of conversation, a lot of politics back then. But we also connected on a, a level of music because, you know, Eva's a musician. Uh, she has a passion for music. Uh, she has a passion for producing and creating. And she invited us to do um, a piece for, I think, one of the very first Equal Justice Society events. Matter of fact, I remember the Lawyers Committee before Equal Justice Society. And so that's kind of how far I go back um, with EJS. And through, let me see, one of the, I think one of the great things that have happened, because I've done many, many projects over the last 20 years uh, around the, the, uh, around the uh, pr prisons, death penalty, Harriet Tubman, Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, um, celebration of many landmark uh, anniversaries, primarily 50 year anniversaries, 1963, 64, 1965, the celebration of 1619 uh, and some other ones. Um, but I think the most in, incredible thing is how Eva has brought people together, artists. So I've had the opportunity of working with people like Johanna Haygood, the great director and producer of this film, Cheo uh, Tahimba, and also um, um, uh, Kevin Johnson. And so just this community that has been built, you know, from Eva Patterson, this powerful nonprofit civil rights firm, um, through this creative mind of using art almost as a uh, as a, an auxiliary tool of the message that EJS is doing and the work that EJS is doing. I'm very proud to sort of be that creative arm. Okay, thank you for that, Marcus. 
The next question is for Chris and Mona. Um, and the question is, what has been the most rewarding experience that you have had with EJS? Uh, and, and why are the arts an important part of EJS's mission? I'm gonna uh, go ahead and take that, that second question about why are the arts an important part of, of EJS's mission with uh, and hope that uh, I do right by Marcus and the other artists who are part of this evening. Um, in just in seeing this piece tonight, this composition and the many pieces of it, the young people who are featured in it, it literally, I think gives us it represents what EJS is, is striving for, um, what our clients have uh, struggled out of and continue to struggle out of. And it, it literally gives us life. And, and speaking personally as an advocate, I, I was watching and just thinking about, as I said, the, um, the young people and, and those are those, the, the young people who are featured in the film and the piece represent what we are trying to achieve for, for all children, particularly uh, black, black students, young people. Um, and I think about, you know, Marcus mentioned um, being drawn to EJS because, what we, because of what we do for um, incarcerated people or people who are victimized and affected by the criminal justice system. And, you know, it, it literally gives us life to and inspired us, inspires us to do things like uh, join when Leif Cabraser asked us to join a lawsuit against the Trump administration for, you know, taking money away, just a, a small amount, but it means a lot to people who are incarcerated and, and their families. We know that incarcerated people, their families are, are disproportionately affected by the COVID. Uh, 19 virus and the economic ruin um, that it has both laid bare and also made worse uh, in our black and brown communities. Um, the work is is tied to that and it, it reminds us that the, the art that is a part of EJS reminds us of why we do the things that we do, why we join that lawsuit, um, why we have to care about people who are incarcerated in issues like mass incarceration um, the themes of struggle and striving for freedom in the piece that we just saw um, fuel the work that EJS does and, and hope uh, you all who have watched tonight can, can make that connection as well. Yeah, I would add <clears throat> uh, the art is incredibly important as well because I think in terms of being able to communicate and appeal to different audiences universally. I think art provides a universal language uh, that's far better, far more engaging, far more useful in certain contexts than the law, for example. Um, and so it can be incredibly challenging and hard working uh, in the legal profession and trying to communicate to folks who may or may not share your opinion, may or may not share your legal theory or uh, any of your experiences um, that are forming some of your legal thoughts and, and your positions. Uh, but when you look at the art, you look at the, the various projects that we've been able and blessed to do uh, with Marcus and other folks, other performers, um, the, their ability to communicate a story, to communicate a narrative that often is not shared uh, in public pl platforms or, or in national news, for example, uh, is amazing. And it, it strikes at the heart and it's beautiful and it's, it's therapeutic and refreshing, uh, certainly to myself and my soul, and I'm sure to others, uh, because it's able to share stories that we often have to walk with in silence. Uh, it's able to communicate ideas, thoughts, um, history that we often are not taught or not shared with us in various stages of our lives. Uh, so I think the art is incredibly important, and that's one of the biggest gifts and blessings of working at EJS is um, having Eva Patterson uh, leading this this ship and being so such an adamant proponent of infusing art with uh, our legal practice. Um, in terms of the most one of the most rewarding moments of working at EJS, I would have to say is uh, Eva's idea of having a shut up and dance party 
and not the immediate past one, but a couple of ones ago when Jeff Fadachi showed up in like a b-boy outfit and was dancing in the middle of the in the of the club, so to speak. Um, that's one of my favorites because all of us who work at EJS would be doing this work regardless of if we were working at EJS or somewhere else. Um, this work is something that we have to go home with every day, something we have to struggle with every day, something we have to reflect on every day. And having a moment where we decided as lawyers or people in the legal community uh, to just stop talking about law, stop talking about all the stress and pain that we have to carry each day, um, and sometimes the, the secondary stress that we carry for our clients who experience things way worse than we do, um, being able to put that aside for one night and join in fellowship and just party and dance and not talk about politics, not talk about our struggles, but just have a moment of joy. Um, and certainly for me personally, finding moments of joy, both in my experiences and just in the world today and, and of years past has been a, a significant challenge. So I'm just appreciative of um, EJS. I'm appreciative of Eva uh, having the foresight and the love in our heart to even want to put that on and then allowing our staff to be able to assist in doing so. And just thankful to all of the legal community who came out and supports us in those functions and these functions in our galas um, all over because it definitely does take a community to be able to really rise above the challenges that we face uh, day in and day out. And it's beautiful to see such camaraderie and collaboration and just uh, those those moments of joy. Okay. I want to jump in and oh, sorry, just to, to quickly share my because I didn't get to share the rewarding experience. And I, there's been so many that it's hard to think of uh, which one to, to talk about. But one uh, that is particularly rewarding was um, all of EJS staff was gathered around our, our laptops in the middle of our day when um, what was then AB5 uh, passed out of the legislature. Uh, and that was, it's now uh, Prop 16, uh, the proposition to ban, uh, to, to uh, restore affirmative action in California. And um, to see and, and to all be, you know, texting each other and see, knowing the hard work led by Eva and our partners on that, knowing the hard work led by so many, that so many people on our staff have contributed to and to see that vote come up on our screen and know that it was going um, to the governor's desk who had already endorsed it and knowing that it was going to be, uh, knowing that as it is now, um, Prop 16 on November's ballot was just a, a real moment of coming together and, and celebrating um, one of the victories along the way to what we hope will be and know and are confident will be um, a justice in in November. So that was a very high point for me. Okay, thank you, Chris and Mona. Um, we have another question for EJS staff. The question is, can you explain the intent standard and the disparate impact standard? I saw the reference in both of the uh, of reference to both in the film. And I guess I would add to that question, why does EJS want to destroy the intent doctrine? Yes, EJS indeed wants to blow up, destroy the intent doctrine. Um, what the intent doctrine is, is the current standard. If you want to um, win in an equal protection case in federal court under the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment that came out of Reconstruction that was uh, created to address the harms of slavery. Yet the, the problem is that if you're trying to prove discrimination in federal court um, under, under the Equal Protection Clause, you have to prove that the defendants actually intended to discriminate when we know, yes, there is overt and intentional discrimination, but we know from uh, experience, from what we see in the world, that a lot of discrimination occurs not because there's a bad actor who says, I intend to deprive Black people of housing, I intend to, you know, de deprive Latino people of, of health care. It is not how it works. Yet the, the intent doctrine says that that's what you have to prove in order to prevail. So the disparate impact standard, which 
uh, thankfully does exist in some contexts, like in the housing context, you can show that the effect of a policy that seems neutral on its face, it doesn't say, you know, black people need not apply, Asian people need not, uh, you know, apply for a loan, but at the same time, it has the same effect as if it was, uh, if the policy or the law actually said that, that's what disparate impact is about. So if you can, under that standard, if you can show that the effect of an otherwise neutral policy um, discriminates against, uh, you know, people of a particular race or, or based on other protected, what we call protected classes, that's the difference. And we want as EJS to move toward and, and inf enforce and, and um, strengthen the, uh, the in disparate impact standard because if you think about it, that is really how discrimination, a lot of discrimination happens in our everyday lives. It's not, again, this intentional bad, bad apple, bad actor saying, I want to you know, discriminate against these people, but it's the effect of policies um, brought about by structural racism or evidence of structural racism that actually cause so much harm and deprivation and keep people from um, in for uh, being able to enjoy their, their rights and being able to enjoy freedom. And so that is EJ, one of EJS's missions because we can't actually get to freedom and to justice without uh, changing our standards so they actually make sense and match uh, the lived experience that people have in these systems that are racist. Did you want to add more to that, Chris, or you're okay? You're cool. Oh, Mona was great, but I would just supplement that by saying I also think part of getting rid of the intent doctrine is, or part of the goal of getting rid of the intent doctrine uh, as carried out by EJS is also alerting the course to just how systemically prejudiced a lot of the court rulings, decisions, uh, and policies have been for many, many years, and the to the extent that they have continued to allow systemic racism and oppression to uh, be uh, pushed upon black people and communities of color uh, for decades now. And so it's not just a legal matter, a legal policy matter, but it's kind of an extension of the history of this country and the belief that black people are three fifths of a human being. And at every juncture for the past several decades, we've been able to see time and time and time again, uh, the reaffirmation of that belief, whether it's through our education system, whether it's through uh, policing, uh, police brutality, uh, through redlining, through um, the denial of voting uh, capabilities for communities of color and black people. Um, at pretty much every turn, we've been able to see the continuing uh, attempt to keep black people in their place, so to speak. Uh, and so getting rid of the intent doctrine is also uh, an opportunity to get rid of a ridiculous standard uh, that does not apply to the lived experiences of Black people and people of uh, color in this uh, country. Okay, thank you both for those answers. Um, the next question is in the chat box for everybody is, how can we purchase the music from the performance tonight? And Marcus has already um, put a, a link in the chat box that tells you where to go to uh, follow up on that. So if you just look in the chat box, there's a link that you can click on that will take you to the place. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's um, Bandcamp. And we have digital downloads there. Um, and just a little bit about the recording. We did it at a small art house called the uh, Red Poppy Art House in San Francisco uh, one Saturday afternoon, August... 15th, I think it was. And, um, you know, we had to build a special room for the trumpet player. You know, we were at the map out. I just really want to thank Kathy, uh, our production manager, really kind of making all of this happen in a very unusual time period. And uh, the sound people, yeah, everybody was very careful on how they recorded everything. But it was just the most unusual, unique way of recording uh, music and uh, and then also outside in these various places and it's all captured on this recording and um, all the environmental sounds 
it's all there. <laughs> and so it's just something, um, you know, usually we go into a very pristine studio and, you know, and kind of do it under very pristine situations. And but this was very raw and c captured the moment, the pandemic, the protests, and um, just the energy and the spirit of Harriet Tubman. So we, we hope that, um, uh, that we could share that with everyone. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, okay, the next question, and we're coming down to the end, or close to the end. Um, this is for everyone on the panel. And the question is, what is the one thing that you think contributed to EJS making it to 20 years? And then the second part of the question is, and what is one thing that you hope to achieve in the work of EJS over the next decade. So I'm gonna take Chris first and then Mona second on that. Um, I would have to say the amazing spirit, will, determination and leadership of Eva Patterson, uh, unquestionably. Um, I, I often marvel at how amazing Eva is, both as a, a force of nature and a change agent for good. Um, and that's definitely been an inspiration to me as a younger person in the legal field, uh, trying to figure out how and where I fit in and what ways in which I want to show up and engage in this work. Um, so I would have to definitely say Eva Patterson has been uh, a leading force uh, and her ability to bring people together and her ability to, to make an, a, an organization feel comfortable uh, and safe for folks to show up in uh, and to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And, Eva has definitely been uh, an amazing captain in that regard. Okay, Mona, do you want to weigh in? I don't want to say that Chris took my answer, so I'm just gonna, yeah. <laughs> although I am saying it, um, but I'm gonna add on to that. And it really is about Eva, but I think Eva would be the first person to say, it's not about me and one person. But it still is about Eva. I was thinking again back to the, um, the film and the piece that we saw where it says she is, and it talks about, it, it represents uh, the foremothers, uh, the young, young people, our leaders of now and the future, and, and Eva, kind of in the middle and the center of it. And so it's, it's Eva, but it's all that that kind of connection and that spirit represents. Okay, um, I'm going to weigh in on this one. Um, since you guys took the first part of the question, I'm going to weigh in on the second part. And on behalf of the board, I would say for the next decade, um, um, I think the current administration has done tremendous damage to democracy, and not just democracy, but also um, how people of color have been demonized and othered in a way that I think will take years to um, repair. And I think that's gonna be a big part of what EJS has to do over the next 10 years is um, clean up the mess that this person has created over the last three and a half years. Um, okay, we're down to our last two minutes. Marcus, did you wanna weigh in on that as well? No, actually, you, you took the words out of my mouth because I was looking at that question, uh, what is one thing that uh, contributed to EJS making it 20 years and what is the one thing you hope to see? I, I was thinking the same thing. There's no shortage of issues that EJS will be tasked to deal with in the next decade, two decades. And thank God for an EJS that represents um, the the least among us, um, the, the oppressed, the, the, um, those who don't have representation, those who have been abused. Uh, and so I was thinking along the same, there's not going to be a shortage of issues that EJS is going to have to tackle. And, and there's, good, there's been more added on over the last three years, as we know. And, in, you know, it doesn't, in, in some cases, even when we, we do have the right leadership, there's been so much years and years and years of damage uh, that, um, whether it's in education, government, what whatnot, 
that EJS is needed more than ever. Okay, well, we've come to the end of our panel. Um, and I, and I want to thank our panelists. Um, first and foremost, Marcus Shelby, uh, Chris Bridges, Mona Tatawa, and me, uh, Michael Harris. Um, it's been a privilege and a pleasure um, spending this time with you. And on behalf of the board and staff of EJS, again, we'd like to thank you for participating in our 20th annual um, event, our gala. And, um, and celebrating our 20th anniversary with us. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. We really are happy you were able to do that. Uh, and we're so grateful. Good night and stay safe. Goodbye.